So I'm going to introduce you to the 100,000 Genomes Project, which we're running in the UK, for those of you who have not heard about this project. So to give you some background, this has been delivered by Genomics England, which is a company set up by the UK government, paid for by the UK taxpayer, um, to deliver this in partnership with our National Healthcare Service, or NHS. Um, so I'm involved um, in my sort of like full-time job pretty much, working with Genomics England, but I'm also an academic involved in the IMPC and the Monarch Initiative, and you'll see how this all ties together as I go through. So just to give you some of the numbers, the 100,000 genomes that we're sequencing are divided up into like 70,000 patients that either have rare disease or cancer, along with their family members. Obviously for the rare disease families, we try and get trios whenever possible. And the key thing here is this is like not a genomic research program. It's, it's all about sort of trying to transform our national healthcare system. So it's a, it's a very sort of different beast to sort of doing a, a research type program with more than half of the NHS trusts in the UK involved in this now. And as you'll see at the end, this has been rolled out um, completely to the NHS. And the mission, so obviously to bring benefit to patients, that kind of goes without saying, but also to enable biomedical research. You, you'll see how he's setting up the research environment to try and speed up translation. Um, to stimulate the genomics industry, particularly the UK genomics industry. Can, you can imagine why the government was kind of interested in this aim. And obviously to do this in an ethical and transparent manner. And just a sort of snapshot of where we were at the beginning, well, exactly a month ago, it's just the point of year. So we've re actually recruited more than 100,000 patients now. We've sequenced over 80,000 of them. I think we're up to 85,000 now. Uh, actually, the majority are, are rare disease genomes or um, genomes belonging to the patient or their family members, and 17,000 of them are cancer. Um, because of the, we needed to do cancer using fresh frozen tissue, this was actually surprisingly hard to recruit cancer patients and train the pathologists, yeah, not to sort of put the biopsy straight into um, paraffin formaldehyde. And then so far, we've reported on about. 28,000 of the genomes coming from the rare disease side. And the sort of the diagnostic rate is around 20% overall. Like, yeah, for some categories like intellectual disability, it's around 40%. There's some, there's some quite obscure categories we also recruit that are likely non-genetic and our diagnostic rates for those are about one or 2%. This is very much a pilot. Yeah, we've got things like familial colon cancer where a lot of the patients we're recruiting are likely not to be sort of single gene. Uh, and this slide just shows that, you won't be able to read this from the back, but we'll be covering all the major rare disease areas and all the major cancer types. And then, as well as like sequencing 100,000 people, we also, when we like enroll participants into the program, we collect a lot of extensive data, which I'll get into in a bit. But we also bring in all the electronic health records we have available in the NHS into our research environment, so things like um, the mortality data, the pathology data, and the biobank data, and, and the hospital episode statistics we've brought in so far, and then we're starting to bring in some of the general practitioner record data as well. So this is all made available to researchers in the environment, which brings me to the next point. So the way we set up our research environment and allow researchers to access this and sort of try and do this in an organized and coordinated way. So is through this Genomics England Clin Clinical Interpretation Partnerships, or GSIPs for short. So I guess this is our equivalent of the Kids First Data Resource Portal. So we set up this research environment and we provide access to the researchers through this mechanism. And this all goes back to Chris's first talk where we're trying to speed up that translation of academic findings into sort of clinical benefit for the patient. So the idea is to have this environment where you bring together all the data, the clinicians who work on these patients and the academic researchers and in industry to actually speed up this whole translation process. Yeah, and then talking about industry, so I've talked about the research environment where we have the academic stakeholders, the clinicians, and our internal Genomics England stakeholders. And then here we have the discovery forum where various companies have joined and signed up to become members of this forum. Yeah, to speed up this whole process of eventually arriving at new diagnostics and therapeutics. So we've kind of seen how that's kind of decreased over the years and the idea of setting up this type of mechanism is to try and reverse some of that trend. 
and then yeah i was just going to give you one success story just to sort of demonstrate how we work and the the type of work we do so today the program's very much been involved around sort of clinically diagnosing patients with known disease genes so this is a good example so this little girl here jessica presented with epilepsy and developmental delay and she'd had all the standard genetic tests and then we ran the sort of bioinformatics pipeline you know doing the the typical things starting with the 6.4 million variants in our whole genome sequence and narrowing it down to the rare ones the ones that affect protein and then looking at you know which variants were different to our parents so it's likely to be a de novo variant we we're hoping and then the other thing we do is curate gene panels for each of our disease categories and these are it's like an expert crowdsourcing app called panel app where anyone can suggest genes that should be added to a panel for a particular disease they can put their evidence and then there's a final round of curation to say whether the gene should be part of that virtual gene panel we apply to the whole genome and using this approach narrowed it down to one gene this sl2 um slc sorry 2a1 so it's a de novo denetian in this gene that caused her glut1 deficiency syndrome and the great news is about this is like by putting her on the ketogenic low carb diet has managed to reduce a lot of her epilepsy also it's a de novo variant so her parents can kind of pretty safely go on and have further children so that made a huge difference to them And then I'm just going to start talking about some of the clinical data and the phenotypes, which is where my work comes in more. So you can imagine this sort of process of going from a patient, you know, there's all these different steps that we've had to build from scratch in the NHS to deliver a genomic medicine service. And yeah, they didn't really exist or we had to like rebuild them to achieve this healthcare transformation. So from consenting the patient through some sample collection, sequencing, interpretation, and finally treatment. And all these later steps really, are really reliant on collecting good clinical data and particularly those clinical phenotypes encoded using a structured terminology such as the human phenotype ontology. So, um, so we, we sort of took this pretty seriously right from the beginning. So for each patient we recruit, so say they have Alport syndrome, there's a particular set of questionnaires. Each one of these is a human phenotype ontology term and we try and ask the clinicians to say whether they definitely have that term or they definitely don't have that term and of course they can also add additional phenotypes but it's a very sort of structured way of collecting this phenotype data and this sort of feeds into so I'll have sort of changing tack a bit in the middle here this sort of feeds into a lot of my academic research interests particularly with the Monarch initiative so we've been making a lot of use of phenotype data in particular and the idea behind all of this is to go beyond using just comparisons of the patient's exome and genome variants to like public genomic data such as NOMAD, you have to start bringing in the phenotype data and comparing it to model organism phenotypes or phenotypes in OMIM to see if we can like further that narrow down the list of potential variants that are causing this patient's condition and imp improve diagnosis and treatment. And another key aspect for us is bringing in other species data. So I think everyone in this room, I probably don't need to labor this point, but obviously there's a lot of genes where we don't know what the phenotypic consequences in human if they're mutated but we do know from looking at model organism databases and we can make use of this data and what we've done over the last sort of 10 years or so as part of Monarch, the Monarch initiative is develop methods to computationally compare compare a patient with a set of phenotypes to like all known diseases in OMIM or Orphanet for instance so we can say yeah, for this particular patient, what disease in OMIM does it most look like? And we can do that computationally. We can put a score on how similar it looks. And we can do it across species. So we can say, yeah, what's the most similar mouse model to that patient and what genes involved? And you can imagine we can start to use this for gene prioritization. And yeah, this is just like a, a couple of slides to sort of say, yeah, we've kind of proven this approach works. So like last year, we, in Nature Genetics, we published this IMPC paper that basically compares all the diseases in OMA and Orphanet to all our IMPC phenotypes. And we managed to show that we can use these computational methods to find new animal models for human disease genes. And it's across all the major body systems, you know, from bone, hearing to the eye. Um, out of all the Mendelian disease genes that we already had data from in IMPC where I managed to show for like 40% of them we could like recapitulate some of the phenotypes 
and key was like 72 percent of these models were novel yeah they hadn't previously been published in the literature there has never been a mass model for that disease before and then the example of this so bardet beadle syndrome and this bbss5 gene that's part of yeah, one of the 19 genes in that big protein complex all of which all those genes are involved in various different types of bardet beadle syndrome and we found the impc mice sort of perfectly recapitulated you know the obesity you can cl clearly see here um, the retinal dystrophy and we find additional phenotypes of so these glucose homeostasis phenotypes that would kind of be interesting again to go back to the human as is seen in bardet beadle patients so the reason I sort of went off track and sort of talked about the academic interests there of like with these phenotype comparison methods is we bring this kind of all together in this Examizer software that we use at Genomics England. So the idea of Examizer is to do the normal starting of a whole exome and a whole genome and to filter down the variants and prioritize them. So you, you hopefully end up with a single candidate that's it segregates with the family, it's in the coding region, it's rare when you look in nomad it's predicted to be pathogenic but most importantly when you look at the gene and you compare the patient's phenotypes to what we know from human disease or from model organisms we can see some sort of phenotype evidence for that gene being responsible for that patient's conditions and Examizer kind of automates that process that we heard in the sort of talk before it sort of tries to make things easier for people so hopefully at the top of your list of candidates you've got that that variant in that gene where there's some already some phenotype evidence that's come from the literature and been curated into these various databases oh and i should make the key point that one of the databases that's going into this is the impc genotype to phenotype associations and we've rolled this out in genomics england so now we use examizer as our sort of parallel pipeline to the virtual panel based approach and it's quite complementary to that approach yeah we can do 300 cases per day per sort of computational node we set up and we can spin up as many of those as we need it's, it's recently been ISO accredited and what we find is we can find yeah looking at the known diagnosis that have come through the program so far we can find maximize will identify that um, diagnosed variant as the top hit in 71 percent of those cases and then the top five in 92 percent and the next re release we're kind of getting up to 97 percent by introducing new features like being able to deal with incomplete penetrance yeah i can skip this one in the interest of time so now i'm sort of going to try and introduce like how we can use impc data for the hundred thousand genomes project so this is kind of a bit of a challenge for this talk so like i said today we've been very focused on those so like 20 percent of cases where we can I, mean, I sort of say it's easy it's not that easy but like make an easy diagnosis in a known disease gene yeah solve those cases that we should be solving but we still got these 80 percent of cases that we're yeah we're giving a negative report at the moment and this is where the those gsip communities are meant to come in research these cases and find some new variants that explain the patient's condition so some of these are going to be variants in known disease genes but there's going to be a lot of really interesting variants like a de novo variant and the gene that's never been associated with human disease and this is clearly where the IMPC data can play a role so what I can do at this stage so I can start to look at some of the positive diagnosis that we've had to date and have a look at the IMPC data and say yeah but the IMPC mass have helped us find this diagnosis if we didn't already know this was a human disease gene as a sort of proof of principle and I've started delving into some of the sort of negative cases where what I'm finding by running XMIs so we can find like rare predictor pathogenic variants in in genes that are not associated with disease before and the phenotype evidence is coming from the IMPC so I can show you an example of one of those but just to show you the type of approach we can use using the IMPC data so this will be a bit hard to see from the back this is our interpretation portal at Genomics England and I've hopefully blanked out all the key patient identifiable stuff but this is a retinal dystrophy patient. We didn't recruit any of the parents, presumably, because it, it was fairly late onset. And this patient was diagnosed with a missense variant in this C1QT NFF5 gene. And this is a known disease gene evolved with retinal dystrophy. So it was, in, it was already on our virtual panel. So it was fairly sort of easy for us to diagnose. Um, we also sort of showed we identified it as the top hit by Examizer. And when I sort of delve into the Examizer results, 
yeah, I mean, it was the top hit by Exomizer because it matches that sort of retinal degeneration disease in Omen. But also, if that wasn't there, like if we didn't know it was a human disease gene, it would still have been the top hit because of this mass match to the IMPC data. So we're matching the patient's phenotype of retinal de degeneration from our IMPC database. So we can see um, abnormalities in the retina. That's what's shown by these bar charts. So these are the mutants so for female and male. And there's all sorts of detailed PDFs you can sort of download. I don't know what they mean, but there's various eye assays that sort of confirm this evidence. So like I say, this is a proof of principle that the IMPC data can help us diagnose patients in the future. Another example of a patient of osteogenesis imperfecta. So here we had the well, we had like um, the the two sibs and the parents, and we identified this de novo variant. So it was only seen in the affected um, female, and there was a missense um, splice region variant in Col one A two. So it's causing um, the HBO tummy that's relevant was the increased susceptibility to fractures. So again, this is like an easy diagnosis to make it's a known disease gene. It was the top ranked hit by Eximizer. But the IMPC actually has some quite nice evidence for, for this. So you, you imagine in the patient has increased susceptibility to fracture, actually in the knockout mass in the IMPC, we see increased bone mineral content and increased bone mineral density, which is kind of intriguing. Yeah, from the knockout, we're getting an increase from that missense variant of getting increased susceptibility, so maybe it's a gain of fu function variant and it shows us some insight into the mechanism. And then finally into like a slightly more interesting story to end up with. So we've got this patient with cataracts and we didn't manage to make a diagnosis from all the analysis to date. Um, but what we find when I run Eximizer, that's so the top here is a, what's it, is a missense variant that's seen in the affected proband and also her mother that's affected of cataracts and it's in this CDKN2A gene and when I sort of started delving into this this gene is actually on our gene panel for cataracts but you see it's marked as red with low evidence so all the experts decided there wasn't enough evidence to really have this gene on the diagnostic panel and actually when I look in PubMed I can't really find any disease evidence and the only reason it was on the panel because it was already part of this UK genetic testing network existing panel. So someone knew a reason why this gene was interesting for cataracts, but somehow that evidence has been lost. But when we look at the Eximizer results, the reason it's the top hit by Eximizer is because of the IMPC mouse that has cataracts. So it immediately sort of shows it up as a great candidate and something to follow up with the clinicians involved in this case. And as I sort of start to delve into the data more, I think we're going to find more and more examples like this. So that's one aspect where the IMPC data can help actually, yeah, as part of Eximizer or other software packages helping us diagnose patients based on our genotype to phenotype associations. There's obviously the functional validation aspect that IMPC can offer. So like I say, I keep banging on about this 80% of the cases, we don't know what the diagnosis is. This is the interesting challenge. Yeah. And we're just putting together a paper on our rare disease pilot, which is based on the first 2,000 families. So what we find there, so, so this is like early analysis, but we've got 77 families without a diagnosis where I can see a strong Eximizer candidate in a gene that's not previously associated with human disease. So it'd be great to make an IMPC mass for that. We've got like 20 families with a de novo variant in a conserved coding region and a non-disease gene again. These would be interesting. Um, these families, so we've got 64 families where we've got sort of trio analysis and a de novo variant in one of these conserved non-coding elements. So this would be like a really nice thing to start modeling using IMPC production and phenotyping. And we've just started to do this sort of cohort type analysis, so burden type testing of comparing all the patients with a particular disease against the controls and looking at the Eximizer results and saying, can you see variants in a particular gene, novel disease gene they enriched? And we've got 39 candidates from there. So you can see we're starting to build up quite extensive lists of genes that it'd be interesting to coordinate. I can see Sarah looking excited. <laughs> and then, so this is all well and good. We've heard about the IMPC. So if it's a null allele that's going to model this patient's condition nicely, we can, like, if there's not an IMPC mass already, we can sort of feed it, try and prioritize it in our production pipeline. But what we've been doing 
for the interesting point mutations is working with the MRC program, genome editing mice for medicine. So this has been there's been four calls so far. So it's been running for a couple of years. So it was, was it like four and a half million giving to the Mary Lyon Center at Harwell to produce these mice with point mutations and various other more complex mutations. And there's been 289 nominations. So this comes from the whole UK genomics sector, but a lot of these will be genomics England cases. And seven, yeah, I mean, that was like involving 31 different institutions. And so 70 lines have been awarded, including 42 point mutations. And, and you can talk to Sarah Wells, who's in the audience, about how, how far we've got with the production and how you get more involved in this. So I think the first mice are starting to be producing phenotypes and sent out. So we should have some good news stories from that soon. And then just to finish off, so you heard from some of me yesterday about this essential gene study we've been doing with the IMPC. So the key finding from this is we can find enrichment of disease genes in this developmental essential fraction. So these are genes that are lethal in the IMPC viability pipeline. But when we look at human cell essential screens, they're not shown to be lethal. So the genes in this BIM are enriched for disease genes. We've also shown they're more likely to be associated with early onset diseases and various other fractions. So what we want to do is start looking at the 100,000 genomes cases. Yeah, can we find a de novo variant in one of these genes, one of the novel ones that's not associated with disease yet? We'll sort of use that to prioritize. Yep. And then I just want to finish off by saying, so the 100,000 genomes project is meant to come to an end at the end of this year. But we're now moving on to this fully commissioned phase in the NHS. So now, like any rare disease patient in the UK, when they come for genetic testing, it will be centralised. And they'll mainly go through whole genome sequencing, which will flow into our centralised database. And this has actually just been announced at the Conservative Party conference, I believe, officially. So it's going to be good news for the UK. And too many people to acknowledge in the whole of the Monarch Initiative, the whole of the IMPC, and the whole of the 100,000 Genomes Project. So with that, I'll finish. Take any questions?